Okay, uh, what we're into is uh, uh, single particle orbits. That is to say, that's what we're trying to, to talk about. And the comment is that we are, uh, should say, by the way, orbits, or we sometimes use the word trajectories. <coughs> trajectories is probably a better um, terminology, uh, although they are a sort of helical orbit, if you remember. So the basic comment is that we've gone through some cases. First, we had an electric field and no magnetic field. Then we had a magnetic field and no electric field. And so now what we'd like to do is do them both together. Okay? So the case we're going to consider next is that we have some electric field and some magnetic field. However, we don't want to make life too difficult, so we'll say that they're uh, both uniform in space, namely a constant, and also uh, that they don't vary in time, uniform in time. You know, they're just constant in time. So this is sort of our, our next case uh, to consider. And what's our, our general uh, relation uh, for calculating the particle orbits? Well, of course, it's F equals MA, which we have as mass times acceleration is equal to the Lorentz force Q E plus V cross B. So that's relatively straightforward. Now, when we were treating the magnetic field case, what we found is we had gyro motion perpendicular to the field, and parallel to the field, we had just straight line motion. And we found it convenient to split into parallel to the field and perpendicular to the field processes, take them apart, so to speak. So taking that as a guide, we'll say, well, let's guess that V is going to be, you know, V per plus V parallel. And likewise, we can imagine that the electric field will have a perpendicular component plus a parallel component. And how do I find those two? Well, remember that if I want then the <coughs> parallel component of, say, the equation of motion, um, what I would do is take a unit vector B, which is along the magnetic field, and I would dot it into that equation. Or I'd take the Z component. We usually make, you know, this is usually in the Z direction. Uh, so basically what I do, eh, let's make it readable. Uh, what we usually do is we say, okay, we want the parallel component. We just uh, take B dot. So what that would give us is an M dV parallel to B dt. Um, is equal to Q times E parallel. And then B dot V cross B is then zero. So we don't get any magnetic field effect along the field line. And this equation of motion, we take the M underneath, and that's just dV parallel dt is Q over M electric field. It says, you know, you get a certain acceleration due to the electric field. And I can just then integrate it as V parallel of T is equal to Q over M times E parallel. Remember, our parallel electric field was a constant. Uh, times time plus V parallel naught, which is whatever um, initial velocity I started out with. Now, I might mention here something we'll come back to when we're discussing questions about uh, various instabilities and various processes in plasmas, notice that the acceleration, or notice that the parallel velocity you get out of this is E parallel over M. So ions and electrons have the same charge, well, opposite sign, but the same magnitude of charge. But their masses are very, very different, 1,836 times. So if I apply a parallel electric field, I will accelerate electrons because they're so lightweight. But I won't, you know, the ions are too heavy weight. They just don't feel much acceleration. We'll kind of keep that in mind, let's just say. Now, if I integrate this equation once more, we, of course, just get the traditional equation that, you know, the position along a field line is whatever the original position was plus whatever the initial uh, velocity was times time plus this acceleration uh, due to the electric field, um, which is just then t squared. Okay, so that took care of the parallel equation of motion. 
And that's almost the same notice as what we had when we didn't have a magnetic field at all. So effectively what happens is when you have a magnetic field, uh, it, the motion along the field line is more or less uh, just free motion, although we'll get back to a little bit of more complicated effects in inhomogeneous magnetic fields. But if I only had a homogeneous magnetic field, it would be just free motion along the field line. Okay, our next job is to dissect out not the parallel motion, but rather the perpendicular motion, perpendicular to the magnetic field. So, you know, we got our magnetic field over here, and we've just been calculating the x-parallel, and we'd like to know how about the x-perp, the motion perpendicular. Well, to take the perpendicular component, we use this back cab rule, and basically what you do is you take minus b cross b cross um, the equation, and the equation is now, again, f equals ma, and what that gives you for the perpendicular equation is just that you have then m dv perp by dt, the perpendicular acceleration, is then just the perpendicular force, which is q e perp plus v perp, which I already could have put in there, uh, cross b. So these are just the, this is just the perpendicular acceleration. So all we've done is dissect out the uh, parallel and perpendicular parts. Now, um, we um, looking at this equation, um, you know, previously when we treated gyro motion, we just didn't have this term. And kind of look at this, and this is a constant, and that's a constant. So maybe we can hook up another constant velocity, v cross b, which would take care of that e perp. Uh, and so that's kind of the way we'll do it. Chen and Bittencourt do this differently. I, I should say, I should have said perhaps, I'm going through these things a little bit different order than Chen and Bittencourt did, um, just to show you a different way of proceeding in calculating these particle orbits. Anyway, that's the equation. So let's uh, let's take as an ansatz or a kind of guess uh, that we'll take that our velocity is really some v perp prime. Uh, which is, you know, just was the, just due to the fact that I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to add something which I'll call v sub e. Now, this v sub e will be a constant, so it's just that, you know, I've got my old gyro motion, or this is presumably going to be more or less gyro motion, I'll try to add some constant and remove that e perp. So this is going to have to be some uh, constant. So we just uh, then substitute this ansatz into there, and then we just get m dv perp uh, prime by dt is equal to q, and now we have e perp plus v e cross b. I'll, I'll organize it a little bit differently here. And then plus v perp prime cross b. Now, if we could arrange, uh, we could choose this to be equal to zero. Um, I mean, we just threw in this constant. We can choose it to be anything we want to. And if we choose it equal to zero, then the equation we're left with is the same gyro motion equation as what we solved before, last time, actually. So to choose that to be equal to zero, you know, we just introduced this constant vel uh, velocity here. Yeah. Left hand side, v prime or just v well, it started out as, the uh, question is, uh, is this v perp prime or v perp? Well, it started out as dv perp dt. But I made this ansatz, and I said it's equal to this plus a constant. Time derivative of the constant is zero. So it is the same, in fact. Um, didn't, didn't quite cheat on you there. It's just that it vanished. OK, so let's choose that. And if I choose that, I then got e perp plus v e cross b is equal to zero. Now, I'd like to solve that for the electric field, I'm sorry, for this velocity, this constant, VE. How do I solve that? Well, I just take B cross it, okay? Now, perhaps the easiest thing to do is let's, uh, well, you can cross it on either side. Let me say that first. So, for instance, we can make this as uh, E perp cross B, so I'll cross it on the right, plus uh, VE cross B cross B is equal to zero. So I, you know, 
cross the equation with B as opposed to the other way around. It doesn't make any difference. Now, this is kind of not quite in my usual back cab form, so I'll, I'll convert it. Namely, it becomes minus B cross VE cross B. And that's still not quite in my simple form where we take B cross B cross. So I'll turn this around into minus B cross VE. It's just sort of the equivalent of fancy footwork in vector analysis. And so in total, this whole business here has become plus B cross B cross VE. Aha, sorry, I get off. I keep getting off the bottom here. Yeah. So um, it's become then just you know B cross B cross. Now, this you remember was equal to minus B squared times the perpendicular component of that velocity. So when I then put this all together, we find that we have E perp cross B minus B squared VE perp. Uh, is equal to zero, or what this tells us is that this constant, in order for this constant velocity to turn out to be a useful one, we should indeed have that VE perp actually is equal to E perp cross B over B squared. And this is known, and we'll, we'll use this an awful lot, as the E cross B drift velocity. Now, there's, we'll keep coming back to this drift velocity and use it an awful lot. But the first thing to notice is that um, does it depend on the charge of the particle? No. The change depend on the mass of the particle? No. Remember the acceleration we had, you know, along the field line did depend upon electric field per unit mass, heavy particles and so forth. But this perpendicular drift velocity caused by the electric field so uh, is, does not depend upon the mass. And notice another thing that's kind of funny here, and, and this is a very characteristic of this electric field. Suppose I had a magnetic field in this direction, my z direction, and I had my electric field in this direction, and so I'm going to pull a current in this direction by having applied that electric field, right? No. It says if I apply electric field in this direction, Particles don't go in that direction to what I've calculated here, but rather they seem to have this velocity in the you know, E cross B direction, uh, namely in my little picture here, up. Right? So this is an unusual property uh, of just single particle charged particles, but it'll also be true for all the charged particles in the plasma, hence it'll be true for the plasma. And the idea is that... Um, the E cross B drift is then in a direction, you know, orthogonal to both E and B, and it does not depend upon the, um, the particle uh, mass or charge. Okay, now a couple other little tidbits about the E cross B drift here. Um, first is that uh, suppose we have our usual situation where um, the magnetic field uh, is in the z direction. And then uh, if we take, then if we look at the electric field or the, this uh, E cross B drift velocity, it's then uh, E cross B uh, z hat over B squared. And if you just uh, work out the vectorial uh, directions of this, this turns out then to be uh, E y x hat minus E X Y hat all over B. So in magnitude, it's proportional to E over B. And that's an additional property, so to speak. Um, so, uh, so anyway, it has this, uh, you know, it's a typical cross product uh, type of thing. Now there's one other thing uh, to go back to. And that is, suppose I go back to the equation from which we got this E cross B velocity, and effectively what we started out with, come back up here, is we had F equals MA. And now imagine that I had added 
uh, to that equation plus some arbitrary force. Okay? Then I could have added that arbitrary force, uh, well, uh, in here, let's say plus some arbitrary force. And if I got that, if I did that, I would go through all the same stuff, but it's sort of like I replaced E perp by force over Q. Okay? So, in other words, I, I then can say that if I had not an electric field force, Lorentz force, which is QE, but instead I had an arbitrary force in my, um, you know, particle um, F equals MA equation, then this would lead to a drift velocity F, a V sub F, which is equal to 1 over Q times that, not E cross B, but the E becomes replaced by um, uh, force per unit Q, F cross B over B squared. So you either, well, so if, you're, if your force is uh, simple, E cross B, you just get the uh, or le regular electric field force. You just get the usual E cross B drift velocity. If, on the other hand, you get the uh, you have an arbitrary force uh, in your equation of motion, then you get uh, a velocity, a drift velocity. So this is a drift velocity due to a an arbitrary. force F. By the way, back up here, I had a lot of perps in there. How come I don't bother to put them down here? Laziness, I guess. But, but anyway, here, anything that's E cross B is clearly going to be perpendicular to B anyway, right? So it's almost redundant to put on a perp here. But, you know, if we really wanted to, we could put little, little perps along here. But pragmatically, it doesn't make any difference, okay? So... That's just a, a nuance of the business. Now, let's. Uh, I want to go just a little bit further. So, so what's really happening to these particles? Well, you remember. Let me say schematically what's happening, and then we'll we'll um, uh, talk about it. So, what's happening is that uh, remember to lowest order, and we'll come back and put all this together. If I had solved this part of the equation dv dt, dv prime dt is equal to v prime cross b, I would have gotten gyro motion, okay? So that's just gyro motion along a field line, okay? With, you know, the, the width is, uh, is two rho, the diameter of that circle is two rho, rho being the gyro radius of v perp over omega c. On the other hand, what we've found now is that the velocity is not just that gyro motion, which is what we're going to get from that part, but it's also plus this E cross B drift. And which direction is that E cross B drift? Well, it's, you know, in my little example here, it's up, okay? So it's sort of like, yes, I have this spiral going along, but it's drifting up out of the paper continuously with time with a constant drift velocity which, by the way, is usually small. So it's, you know, mostly going along here and then slowly drifting off, off the paper, okay? Now, mathematically, uh, you can sort of work all that out, uh, and kind of say it that way. Uh, and so let, let me go back then to say that if we have, you know, our total velocity is equal to the V per prime, which is the gyro motion part plus the E cross B, um, if you just uh, go back and, and uh, add up what the V per prime was, um, well, let's see, what you can show is that the X of T, you know, how you go in X, which is out of the board up there, uh, is equal to um, the X, uh, well, the X naught minus V perp over omega c, or v per prime, it's actually in the moving, in E cross B moving frame is what it really is, times the cosine of omega c t uh, plus phi naught 
and then plus this drift, EY over B uh, times time. And you can also just write this. These first two are, you remember, we had that the particle is some constant plus its gyro motion, and the two together become the guiding center. Okay. Um, so, well, okay, I, no, I, I, well, anyway. I don't want to make this, I don't, I don't want to do that, just a moment, sorry. Anyway, so then y of t is similarly uh, y naught um, plus v per prime over omega c and then uh, the sine of omega c t plus v naught then minus ex over b times time um, just because the plus and minus that goes into the e cross b up here. So all I wanted to, I guess, um, the reason for doing that um, is to then say that if you add together uh, all of that, what you can show is that the equation is governed by uh, x of t minus x guiding center um, initially um, minus its drift off vx t quantity squared well, let me write the whole thing out, and then we'll explain what it means. Uh, y minus y guiding center, y of t, uh, minus y guiding center naught, uh, minus v e um, sub y t quantity squared, turns out to be v perp squared over omega c squared, which is equal to rho squared. I guess I could put these back up to show you how this works out. Um, Yeah, I maybe should say that the combination of this and this um, gives you uh, Y guiding center. So the idea, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you just sort of go through the mathematics and come back to this picture, um, you know, again, the particle is gyrating around the field line and it's slowly drifting up in the vertical direction. But it is doing so, by the mathematics here, in such a way that even as it goes drifting along, it maintains the same gyro radius. So even though it's drifting off that field line, its gyro radius is, is constant, does not change. So um, gyro radius, yeah. legible here. Gyro radius unchanged as the particle drifts in the E cross B direction. Okay, so the idea is that uh, even though uh, it is drifting and moving, it's not really accelerating and changing the velocity. Okay, just E cross B drifting is the best way to say this. Um, how big? Uh, how big could the E cross B velocity be? Well, it'd be nice if it wasn't relativistic, since we're doing non-relativistic treatments. You know. So uh, maybe as a condition, we'd like to have that the E cross B drift velocity is much less than the velocity of light. Is that uh, a problem, so to speak, to satisfy that? Well, the magnitude of our E cross B drift velocity is the magnitude of E divided by the magnitude of B. And that's what we would have to have small compared to the velocity of light. Is that a problem? Well, let's consider a magnetic field B on the order of one Tesla. And then what this criterion would be in MKS units is that we would need an electric field strength much less than 3 times 10 to the 8th. And what would the units of that be? 
Well, C would have had units of meters per second, 310 to the 8th meters per second, in MKS units, E over B multiplied by B, and this becomes volts per meter. So, over a distance of uh, 1 meter, 300 megavolts. So, usually that's a, you know, that's not a bad assumption. Uh, we're we're non-relativistic, usually. And so, usually it turns out, yes, this E cross B drift velocity is, is very non-relativistic. So this is for uh, non-relativistic uh, E cross B velocity. Yeah. Non-relativistic um, E cross B drift velocity. OK, so that sort of uh, says about as much as we want to say about uh, the subject of, um, uh, this was the case, you remember we had E and B, but both were constant in space. So of course the next thing you can imagine we're going to have to do is do a little something about E and B not being constant in space. Now, if E and B are not in constant in space, life can get very difficult. Uh, however, we have a cop-out or not a cop-out, it's a very good approximation, but, uh, and physically motivated. Um, so suppose we have non-uniform or inhomogeneous electric and magnetic fields. Um, so let's kind of just draw or sketch ourselves some electromagnetic fields over here. And, you know, B might be inhomogeneous like this. Now, how big was this uh, gyro radius we keep talking about? Well, it was down around a centimeter, tenths of a centimeter, something like that. And, you know, sort of laboratory plasmas, we imagine, are 10 centimeters in size, maybe even 100 centimeters or something like that. So we get the feeling that, in fact, the gyro radius rho is small, compared to what we'll call a macroscopic length L, which is sort of the distance over which the magnetic field varies in some sense, which we'll be a little more specific about in a moment, by a factor of two. So we're going to be perfectly happy, it turns out, to take rho much less than that scale length L. And this is called a small gyro radius or small Larmor radius, either one, uh, approximation. And physically all it says is that a particle is gyrating around a field line, and as it gyrates, it sees a more or less constant field, and that we're going to be perfectly happy to expand, the, 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 in a Taylor series, the magnetic field seen on the particle. So, for example, what we're going to say is we're going to say that the real spatial position is equal to the guiding center position. Um, you remember that when we were talking about this, the guiding center was right along that field line, okay? So this is X guiding center. And here's, here's where I need additional colors and don't have them. Um, and here's to some particular position of the particle, so this is the um, the real position x, and then the difference between the two is this this little rho vector, which is the gyro motion uh, vector. So the idea is the particle's more or less on the field line, the guiding center, plus it wiggles around that with the gyro motion. So it's going to be x guiding center plus rho. And then what we'll be inclined to do is say, well, the magnetic field B of X is equal to B at the guiding center. And then it's more or less homogeneous around that, smoothly varying, doesn't vary very much. And so we'll take the Taylor series expansion. Now, the Taylor series expansion does get a little bit fun here because, you know, you take a Taylor series expansion in vectorial coordinates, and you're going to get a rho dot del times B. Okay. Now this is not kind of your ordinary 
del B because this is actually the gradient, which is a vectorial quantity, of a vectorial quantity. So this is, in fact, a tensor. Um, we won't really deal with that too much. I, just, just because I won't show you all the agonizing algebra that goes into really doing this stuff up right. But anyway, that is a tensor. And uh, in the minute here, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some properties. Um, and in some sense, we're going to argue that this term is small. And we'll take account of the first such term, but we'll neglect, say, rho squared, del squared type terms. Those would be second order. Okay. Now, uh, so, so let's uh, make sure we understand what we're sort of saying here. Uh, so what we're saying is here's a B, a, a variation in the magnitude of the magnetic field as a function of uh, some coordinate like X or something like that. And what we're saying is that the gyro motion is very small scale there. You know, it's just I'm sitting on a field line. It's just wiggling around. B is varying as I, as I move across here, and B is varying in magnitude, but I don't vary very much. What we're not doing, uh, I, I want to make sure you understand, is that if we had a B that did this um, as a function of X, and we had gyro radii which were this big, okay, um, so let me say this is a... Uh, this is not what we're doing. So this would be a big gyro radius situation in compared to the inhomogeneity uh, length or typical inhomogeneity length. So this is what we are doing. We're saying everything's kind of smooth. We got small Lormer radii compared to the inhomogeneity scale lengths. Now, uh, since we see something like rho dot del b here. Uh, we need to talk a little bit about what magnetic field structures look like. And in particular, what do we mean by grad B, and what parts does it have, and what do they mean, and that sort of thing. So that's our, our sort of next uh, uh, subject, um, which I will call um, magnetic uh, structure. And this is kind of important to know for things like uh, the Earth's magnetic uh, or magnetosphere, for instance, um, uh, magnetically confined plasmas, and uh, all kinds of things. Now, and, and by the way, in those situations, unfortunately, we have examples of all kinds of distortions of the magnetic field, all possible types of magnetic field um, geometries and such. Now, let's proceed for a little bit mathematically first, and then I'll show you what the, physically these terms mean. And this particular discussion actually comes in large part out of, by the way, uh, Bittencourt's book. Anyway, so grad B is a tensor. It means I effectively, it's a, a second rank tensor. It means I can effectively represent it in terms of a matrix. And so, in fact, I could write grad B is equal to a um, uh, uh, um, a row um, vector x, y, z times dBx by dx, uh, dBy by dx, dBz uh, by dx, and then dB uh, x by dy. This is for a general, you know, field that has all kinds of components. Most of the time we won't take that, but we need to understand what these components mean. Uh, dBy by dy, dBz by dy. And then the final row is dB uh, x by dz, dBy by dz, and dB z by dz. And then this matrix of coefficients of the, the gradients components here needs to be multiplied then by x hat, y hat, z hat. And this is in Cartesian coordinates. Sometimes when we're doing fancy theory, we actually have to get a little more complicated. 
and the gradient actually operates on the unit vectors. Okay, the B is you know has a component, say in a curvilinear coordinate system, you know, in the cylindrical direction or something like that. But let's write out what this really means. So you know, there's a component of this tensor which is x hat x hat times dBx by dx. Okay, so that was the one one component up here. Just worked it out. Then we'll have an x hat, uh, y hat, uh, then dBy by dx, and there's a lot of terms. How many terms total, by the way? Nine terms. Are they all independent? Can I have just any ordinary, you know, type of uh, um, all terms? Well, there is a constraint on this. Remember, there's one of Maxwell's equations says there's, there are no magnetic monopoles, or divergence of B is equal to zero. Okay, and that is that we have dBx by dx. Just writing out the divergence in these. Um, X, Y, Z Cartesian coordinates. Uh, dBx by dx, dBy by dy, plus dBz by dz. And so what this says is the diagonal components here of the matrix are not actually all three independent, but rather there's a relationship between them. And so there's not, that while there might be nine terms, there's really only eight independent quantities. Okay, but uh, okay. Now, um, by the way, uh, many times uh, you might think, well, gosh, another thing I could use is Ampere's law: curl B is equal to J. And then I'd like to maybe say I don't have any currents in the plasma, so I could say curl B is equal to zero. Therefore, B is derivable from a gradient of a potential and get a Poisson equation. But unfortunately, I can't, it turns out in most plasma situations, I cannot easily set the current to zero. Because remember, we've got all these charged particles moving around. And so lo and behold, they're going to create currents. And because they create currents, I kind of have to take account of that. But in some sense, those currents are proportional to how much plasma you have present. So, uh, it's going to turn out that many times we'll make an approximation called a low beta approximation whereby uh, well, there's not too much current and so we can more or less have the vacuum fields. But um, anyway, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, uh, a couple other properties and then we need to talk about the parts of this. Um, the other properties I wanted to talk about um, are that for convenience we often choose uh, it's just a convention. It doesn't have to be this way, but it's sort of what everybody does. Um, we choose um, that at the position um, z equals zero, you know, wherever we choose to put the origin of our coordinate system, that at that position the magnetic field points in the z direction. Okay, so at that particular position, uh, B is in that, dire in that direction. And that indeed, B0, however, may have dependences on the other three Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and Z. Now, um, we're going to want to talk about, uh, oh, so I'm sorry, so maybe I wanted to sketch this. So often we'll have uh, some coordinate system, x hat, y hat, z hat. And the idea is that we have some uh, magnetic field line in this structure, which is just tangent right there at the origin. And it may come off at some other angle, you know, and have some, maybe I should draw it back here some curvature and twist and all kinds of things. And uh, we'll need to worry about that in a moment. Um, now, suppose I needed to um, 
to describe this magnetic field line in space. And so I needed a few equations. You know, I want to follow along that field line. Well, I can do that by making myself a little arc length. Okay, d l. I usually call it. Um, I noticed what's his name? Um, Bittencourt's calls it d s. But anyway, we could rather easily say that motion along a field line d x is just d l which is an in incremental distance arc length here along that. But then it's got to be in the local direction of B. So that'll be B vector over B. Um, and this will lead you to, if I now take the X component of this equation, the y com uh, X hat dot this equation gives me then that DX uh, is equal to dl bx over b. The y hat component gives me that dy is equal to dl by over b. And finally, the z component uh, gives me that dz is uh, dl bz over b. And the way this is typically organized into one equation is one writes that dl over b is equal to dx over bx plus, or which is also equal to dy over by, which is equal to dz over bz. So if I need to follow a field line in the three-dimensional space, as long as bx, by, and bz don't vanish at the particular point I'm interested in. I just use these equations to say as I want to move along the arc, I move in x and y and z according to these. I can either use these forms or this form. Another way of writing this equation uh, it's, that's equivalent is that dl cross b is 0, which just says the arc length is parallel to the local magnetic field. Okay, this is sort of uh, mechanics in the background. Now what I want to do is come back to this tensor grad B and illustrate uh, the parts. So remember uh, this tensor here, and it has these nine terms or eight independent components, a little more than we'd like to, to uh, reconcile ourselves to, but nonetheless it does. And so what we'd like to talk about are the parts of this tensor grad B. And they represent various things that field lines can do. One, the first one is we have the terms which are represented by the divergence uh, terms. And those you remember were uh, dBx by dx, dBy by dy and dBz by dz. And they corresponded, they were, they were parts of divergence b is equal to 0. What do those terms correspond to uh, physically? Well, physically they correspond to the divergence or convergence of field lines. So what they correspond to is if you have a a divergence of field lines, what you have is this, okay? And I guess I should make these, actually they could be straight, but they're diverging, so this would be diverging field lines. Or we could have converging field lines, okay? Um, on the other hand, Okay, another class of term, and here I have to use the definition of the direction we used, was the gradient terms. And the idea here is that we have the derivative of B uh, with respect uh, to X at Z equals zero. So this would be the gradient in the X direction, but in fact, since at the point z equals 0, b was equal to only bz, this becomes dbz by dx. Uh, 
or alternatively we could also have dBz by dy in the other. And what does the gradient look like? Well, it sort of says that, you know, the, the B may be in this direction, in the Z direction, but there are more field lines in one place than another. So there's a gradient. So here's the B, and uh, let's see, I'll, I'll make the gradient uh, up. So let me do it that way. So I've got uh, sparse field lines below, and as I move up, I've got ever denser field lines, okay? And this would then be the direction of the gradient of B. B is mod B, modulus of B is, of course, the density of field lines, okay? So I've got a higher density of field lines. So these two terms out of that um, three by three matrix represent these gradient terms or the bunching uh, density of field lines. What else can happen? Well, I can have curvature of the field lines, right? And which terms are they? Uh, well, it turns out they are the dBx uh, by dz and dBy by dz terms. And what they represent, okay, is field lines that do this. And we'll find it convenient a little bit to say, to call this the radius of curvature of those field lines. Um, but the basic idea then is we've got converging, diverging, grad B, and curvature. Now there's only one final type of magnetic field um, structure part that we need to care about, um, and that and that is what's called shear. Um, so we've gotten through A, B, and C, and uh, so this, uh, the last one we'll have is uh, D, and that's uh, what we'll call shear in the magnetic field, and sometimes people will call it twist. Um, and these are dBx by dy and dBy by dx. Okay? And this one's a good bit harder to draw, but let's suppose we have our, our standard situation here, and we have that our field lines uh, is coming off from the origin this way. Okay? But the idea we want to have is that the field lines twist relative to each other, and the way we can depict that here is that there's a field line, or a, a line that does this, and instead of the field lines coming out, um, like, let's see, on various paths here like this, um, they're a little bit below and a little bit above, and so the idea is that the field lines twist as they move in the x direction in this particular case. So I've chosen here uh, this case, okay? So the idea is that the magnetic field is still in the, more or less in the z direction, but that the field lines are twisted or sheared, okay? They're going in different directions as I move in distance x away from some position x equals zero. So this is the uh, shear or twist in the magnetic field. Okay, so these are then the types of uh, uh, structures or, or you know, uh, again, the divergence. I can have diverging or converging field lines. I can have grad B or density of them. I can have curvature, and I can have uh, twist or shear in the magnetic field. And in principle, I have to allow for all of these, and they all are pieces of that uh, grad B uh, tensor.